Okay, anyway, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, I did mostly when I was at the Max Planck Institute. So it was Ignacio, uh, Adrian, uh, who are both research scientists. Ignacio is a professor there. Adrian was a postdoc and PhD students, Guillermo, Satvik, and Miguel. Um, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me and ask. Okay, so let me begin with maybe a, a Yeah, okay. No, it's fine. Sorry. Uh, so so let me uh, begin with like a very, very qualitative introduction to uh, quantum hardware and the uh, perspective on the field in general. Um, so as we maybe all realize or know, and we have seen many experiments uh, coming out of different experimental groups uh, in the US as well as in Europe. So right now, it seems like if we take the state of art experiments, we have uh, quantum hardware devices where you can have off the order of 50 to 100 qubits that could maybe interact with each other, but the qubits are noisy. So you have uh, uh, you have noise or error rates, which maybe go from one to 5%. Of course, in the long term, the goal is to do what is called in the field fault tolerant quantum computations. Uh, the idea behind fault tolerant quantum computation is that you sort of compensate for these errors using error correcting codes. Um, I will not really talk about error correcting codes in my talk because this, um, neither am I an expert on it. So, but the idea, roughly speaking, at a very, very qualitative level, is that you sort of take many, many physical qubits and use many physical qubits, which individually could be noisy, to encode one effective logical qubit. So, your quantum information, the number of qubits of information that you have is much smaller than the number of qubits that you're actually using in your hardware. And if you look at realistic estimates of how many qubits you need to be able to do fault tolerance, uh, it is well beyond what we have uh, in lab today. So even to have one logical qubit, you probably need to use all, if not more, of the physical qubits that people are able to prepare. So an important question that has been raised, and that has been something that people have been looking uh, at for a very long time now, is what can we do with this in the near term? And by near term, it's near term by the standards of quantum information technologies, which means five to 10 years. Um, and the idea is that, well, because it is hard to implement fault tolerance, can I do something with encoding one logical qubit into just one physical qubit instead of going for uh, many physical qubits into one logical qubit? So these are the two questions that maybe I will uh, talk about today. Um, so the first question that we want to answer is that what are the limitations of noisy quantum computers? So what we want to understand is that if we do have a noisy quantum computers with some noise and error, then at what parameter regimes of noise or what parameter regimes of the number of qubits do you lose? You do you definitely lose quantum advantage. So there can be no hope of using that device for any classically, uh, uh, for, for any uh, any uh, task that you don't have classical algorithms for, for instance. And then the second question, which is maybe more optimistic is to understand if there are indeed some problems when we are in a regime, which is let's say sufficiently low noise, but not uh, noiseless enough to be able to do fault tolerance, then are there any interesting problems which I can then solve with uh, these unimported quantum computations? So these are the two questions that uh, we will we, we, um, touch upon in my uh, talk today. Okay. So I'm going to begin with the pessimistic uh, set of results first. Um, and so the idea is to start coming up with uh, some impossibility results. So let me give you a very... Um, here, so let me give you a very, very um, somewhat general, but still a little bit restrictive formulation of the kind of problems that we're interested in. So what we're interested in maybe in the community one could be known as variational quantum algorithms, but they're not really restricted to variational quantum algorithms. So the way you can think about it is that you have n qubits here, and you apply some gates on these n qubits, and these gates are parameterized by some parameters, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. And then depending on what gates you apply, you prepare a quantum state at the output. So you have some quantum state that depends on the circuit that you're using, or very obviously. Um, now the circuit is noisy, so there is there is some error or noise that's happening on the circuit. Um, and, I, and the noise that we are looking at is what is called depolarizing noise. It is essentially a sort of noise in which you take a qubit, you remove it, you sort of lose it and replace it with a random bit left. So you completely lose the information of what is in that qubit and you replace it with a uniformly random probability distribution. 
Um, and in, with this noisy state, then what I'm usually interested in doing is take a problem Hamiltonian H and maximizing the energy of this Hamiltonian. So finding the largest eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian to the best of my capabilities, which I can by tweaking the parameters of this. Okay. So the question that then we wanted to answer is that, where well, we mentioned that we want to provide a regime where there is no quantum advantage. And one way of thinking about it is pictorially here. So if you look at this problem, this is trying to maximize the energy of this Hamiltonian. So the maximum value that you can get is equal to the maximum eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian. So that is the point here. This is what you want to reach. Now, even in the absence of noise, there is actually no guarantee that you can reach this, this point. And in fact, there are problems where you can have some evidence that you cannot reach this point even with noiseless circuits. But for the purposes of our analysis, we can assume that let's say a noiseless circuit comes very close to the correct solution. So if you didn't have noise, you would be in good shape to solve this problem. Okay? Um, this is a non-trivial statement, but we'll work under this assumption. And the question now that we want to answer is that if we inject noise into a noiseless circuit, then it becomes noisy. So the performance of the circuit becomes much smaller than what you would get with noiseless circuit. And I want to figure out a number somewhere in middle, which would tell me that the noisy circuit cannot possibly exceed this barrier. So I want to compute an upper bound here such that I'm guaranteed that no matter what I do with my circuit, as long as I have a finite rate of noise, I can't cross this barrier. And then with this barrier, what I could do is I can go and check it against classical algorithms. I can go and use a classical computer and see what kind of values I can compute. And depending on where the barrier lies, I can then tell you whether your experimental system is something that is that have even any hopes of doing better than classical algorithms, or in, in, in any case, a classical algorithm can do something better. Okay. So this is, of course, uh, a problem that is uh, not new, and people have thought about this problem at great extent. And so maybe a very uh, somewhat qualitative interpretation of this problem is to think about how noise increases the entropy of the quantum field. So one way of thinking about this problem is that you have some qubits that you uh, start off in a state, which is just a pure state, and you, then you apply these unit trees one after the other on, on these qubits. Now, in the absence of noise, these unit trees would basically uh, work perfectly, and you would get a state here, which is the application of this full unit tree on an initial state. In the presence of noise, this there is you can imagine an environment or some external uh, uh, factor that sort of goes to these qubits and measures them and completely destroys the quantum information that you are creating on these qubits. So this environment is sort of coming and uh, destroying your quantum information after every time. Now, what happens when you have this environment is that your state goes from a pure state to a mixed state. So you have a pure state which, which was one perfect quantum state, but the moment it was measured by the environment, then the state that you have now will not, no longer be a pure state. It, it will have it will be a mixed state. And one consequence of having this mixing is that your state has non-zero entropy. So the state now has some finite entropy in it. And what you could show, and this was shown very, very long ago, almost at the start of the field of quantum error correction for tolerance and so on, is that if you keep on applying a depolarizing noise at every time step, then the entropy of your quantum system keeps on increasing steadily as your time steps go on. And so you can, in fact, without much difficulty, prove a lower bound on the entropy that is, that is given by this formula here. And here is the number of qubits. P is the amount of time steps that you perform, and P is the rate of noise. So if P is equal to one, then your entropy uh, is equal to N, which means that it is as maximally mixed as it can be. So, so you have really no information in your quantum state at all. And if P is equal to zero, this entropy is zero. So you are in a pure state and it's perfect quantum information, at least, uh, or it's a perfectly pure state. So now what is the consequence of this entropy? So if you remember what we were interested in doing is finding the minimum or maximum energy, the maximum energy that I wrote is minimum, the same thing, but the minimum energy of a plot problem Hamiltonian. Um, now, if you think about a Hamiltonian, then the Hamiltonian has some eigenstates. And in the case of a many body problem, each of these eigenstates is a pure state. And what you want is that this density matrix be completely equal to the ground state. So you definitely want it to be a pure state. In the presence of entropy, this is not possible because if your state has some finite entropy, you necessarily need to cover some number of excited state to have the same amount of entropy in your system. And so that means that the average value that you would, that the energy value that you would be computing would be somewhere in the middle 
of the states that you have uh, that, that you have to account for depending on the sense of rebound here, right? And so this already tells you that in the presence of noise, the energy of your state is going to be much higher depending on well, what is the rate of noise than the energy of the ground state. So it gives you a way of finding a bound on this uh, on this on this point. So this was something that was made formal in this very seminal work by Hanumov. And then what she essentially showed is that because your entropy is increasing with time, it is, uh, it is strictly increasing with time, uh, then as you start off with some initial state that could be a nice pure state, but as you increase time, this state sort of collapses into the maximally nice state. So at a sufficiently large amount of time, and you can bound the amount of time that you need that goes on log of n divided by the noise rate, we are going to be very, very close to the maximum state. So in some sense that after you have evolved for a, for a quantum circuit with depth that is larger than this time, since you're going to be at the maximum limit state, you don't expect to have any advantage in your quantum computation at all. And you are simply going to be limited. Uh, you, can, you can reproduce the answer that you get here by a classical computer. So this was a very, very good. Now, more recently, what people did was they started looking at this result more carefully because this result still seemed make it made it sound that um, there could be some circuits of depth smaller than one by p log n that you could maybe get advantage. And if you actually put reasonable numbers of p and log n, this evaluates two circuit that may be 100, 200, or something like that. So maybe the current hardware is still in false in this regime and not in this regime of quantum advantage, right? So one of the things that some researchers did, uh, this is a uh, work by Franca Garcia Patron last year, um, last year and this year, where they said that when this is too restrictive a criteria, because here what you're demanding is that the state becomes very close to the maximum limit state. And what they said, what they said instead is that what we want to do is take a state whose energy becomes very close to the end to our energy that I can compute classically. So if you look, instead of the distance in state, you look at the distance in the energies then this distance actually becomes trivial far more much faster than the distance in the state so even though your state could be very different from a maximally limit state you could still compute a, a quality and energy of hamiltonian you know, or you could still compute on a classical computer an alternative state which gives you roughly the same energy so as far as computing the computing the energy goes you don't really care about the state at all and you can get very close to the energy by just you running a classical algorithm so they basically took the same setup and then said that the, the, the um, advantage is actually lost much faster. It is lost at a time that goes as one over p. There's no log n here. And after the one over p, you don't really get any quantum advantage. Right? So, so, uh, so you really need to be less than this one over p to get quantum advantage in solving these optimization problems. Um, OK, so uh, is there any questions, please? Yes. So just to make sure I'm following, are you saying that under the effect of depolarizing noise by the bro not, you always tend towards the Gibbs state? Uh, yes. So here you tend towards maximum unique state, and here you tend towards a state whose energy is very close to the Gibbs state. It may not exactly be a Gibbs state, but if you look at its energy uh, as given by an Hamiltonian, then it's very close to the Gibbs state. Um, for what other noise models we have this sort of, it reminds me of thermalization. Um, what other noise models is there? Yeah, that's a good question. This is only for uh, depolarizing okay. or generalized. So, uh, so for qubits, these will be called, uh, these will be uh, unital noise models that we need to explain. So they're called uh, so the noise channels. Uh, the technical term is a unital primitive noise channel. So if your noise channel is primitive and unital, then this property holds. If it is not primitive uh, or it is not unital, then you can have situations where the entropy is decreasing. It is not necessary that the entropy increases. But if it is depolarizing or slight generalizations of depolarizing, it's always yeah. Okay. So let's see. So here we have an upper bound on the distance. Like you want to have this quantity that lets the upper bound there. So I think the way to think about this is that uh, here the uh, the point is that if you take like consider this to be um, row two of H, and you consider uh, the uh, optimal to be let's say row one. Then, if you want to get this within a precision epsilon, then your beta is uh, the temperature that you get for T that scales as one over P is sufficiently high to be able to sample from the Gibbs state. So that's the so, so, so uh, you can formulate it in terms of an upper bound as well. But the key point is that the distance in energy is 
the distance and the, the, it is very close to a deep state of sufficiently high temperature because of the accumulation of energy. And this happens after a time that is just far away. Okay, so now both of these results, however, have an issue. And that issue is something that we sort of wanted to fix in uh, one of our work, uh, which is that we are not really accounting for what are called propagation of, uh, of sorry, what propagation of errors, not a very fancy term. Um, and so the idea here was that, uh, as I mentioned, the whole idea behind the previous two results that I showed you was to basically track entropy. So it's saying that every time you apply noise, the entropy increases. If you don't apply noise, if you're just doing unitary, it doesn't change the entropy because the unitary maps pure states to pure states. Yeah. Um, so when so this bound that I wrote here, it is actually true for any unitary because all that it demands is that the unitary is uh, is a unitary. Can be a unitary that can be extremely non-local. It can be a unitary that's very local. It could be not creating any entanglement. It could be creating a lot of entanglement. This amount sort of works for any of these cases, right? So it's a very, very uh, loose bound, so to speak. Um, and in particular, if you try and think about an example of a circuit which would saturate this bound, so where this entropy is exactly equal to the global bound, then one example that you come up with is a circuit which is just single qubit gates. So you have n qubits and you just apply single qubit gates one after the other. And for this particular problem, if you start with an initial product state and you apply depolarizing noise, you can just analytically compute the entropy at the output. This is exactly equal to this lower bound that I get. Now, but obviously, these kind of circuits are completely uninsisting because they are not doing anything. They're just keeping product state to product state. And in actual practical situations, you might be interested in circuits when you have uh, some two qubits or even more uh, complicated gates, which are getting qubits to interact and building some entanglement during your, uh, in your quantum circuit. And for these kind of gates, the expectation was that the entropy is actually going to be much, much larger than the entropy of uh, than the entropy that you get from this bound, which is essentially the entropy when you don't have any entanglement at all. And an intuitive explanation for why this entropy is much, much larger is because these kind of circuits propagate error. So if you have an error, let us say at the qubit at the beginning of your computation, then because of the way the quantum circuit is applied, this error is going to affect subsequent subsequent qubits um, and subsequent following qubits as well. Um, so in general, you expect that this upper bound is actually much, much, uh, much higher for many for many the circuit. So now the question was that can we actually get um, make use of the property, make use of this uh, phenomenon of propagation of errors and maybe give even better bounds on when we lose uh, quantum advantage. So we did this in two ways. So one way of doing this was to do was to go into a random circuit model. Um, and the idea behind the random circuit model was to sort of think about now a family of circuits that solve the optimization problem and sort of make a statement on whether a typical member of the family of circuit. Um, of how much how much is a typical member of the fan of the family of circuit affected by noise? So that was a statement that we wanted to do. So a very very simple model that you could come up with uh, is that you take, let's say, a circuit which is uh, solving the optimization problem. So imagine that you solve just a circuit that solves the optimization problem, and for the sake of argument, let's imagine that this circuit is ideal, it's lossless, right? And this actually even makes sense for classical optimization problem because even though the view solve is hard to find, you can imagine that this classical optimization problem is finally just going to give you a sequence of bits, and you can simply flip the right bit to, to whether it's one or zero by applying a gate on each bit. Right? And then what we can do is we can insert an identity here, which is by applying u and u dagger. Um, and so in this particular fashion, the output of the quantum circuit is constrained to be equal to the solution of your optimization problem uh, for any value of u in the absence of noise. In the presence of noise, however, the output is going to be significantly different from the solution of your optimization problem. And then you could take random unitary circuits here and ask whether on an average how different this output is. Um, now this problem problem happens to be uh, interesting. It has some well, relatively easy to see properties. I maybe won't go too much into the details, but you can average over unitary circuit efficiency and classical computers. You can just come, you can compute this average in Markov using Markov chain. So that's like a nice analytical property. And you can analyze this average quite well um, on classical computers. And perhaps the key result that we, we can prove in this statement is that we can use, we lose quantum advantage at a rate which depends on the dimensionality of the circuit. And it is, it is much worse than the, than the rate at which 
uh, delenoid. In fact, for very high dimensional circuit, you would lose quantum advantage at extremely low noise. It's almost with e tends to infinity. This is you will almost always lose quantum advantage with just one layer. But in for one D circuits or two D circuits, you would lose quantum advantage uh, far uh, far much faster than this one over p bound. Um, and so this is maybe although in terms of scaling with system sizes, it's maybe not that big an improvement because you go from a system size independent bound to a system size independent bound. But because in the, the, the goal here was to improve the scaling with F. So the error that you have currently, if you plug in those practical numbers, then so this sort of bound will still give you a depth of somewhat like 100 to be able to do um, some non-trivial computations, whereas the bound that we show is much worse. It might tell you that something after a circuit depth of 10 or 20, you already lose any ability to do any useful quantum computation. Um, so now, of course, this is um, one criticism of these kind of results is that you're doing some kind of an averaging. So what you're doing is you're taking some random circuits and then you're averaging over these random circuits. And so one of the criticism that you can levy against is that, well, how representative is this averaging? Um, that's a very legitimate result because a lot of circuits that we are preparing experiments are not average circuits, just those sort of working a special circuit that you might be designing for an optimization problem. And so the question that then we started asking was that is it possible to take a specific circuit and still compute an upper bound on how well the circuit can perform? And hopefully we can compute this upper bound on a graphical computer. So now the setting here is the following. I give you a quantum circuit, a circuit with some unitaries u1, u2, u3, and so on. And then there is a noise rate P that is acting on this quantum circuit. And I want to again compute an upper bound of the energy. The same problem that we have been looking at. But now you give me the unitary that you're preparing in experiments. You tell me that my experimental system has unit. This is the unitary that I'm applying the first few qubits, and this is the unitary I'm applying on the next few qubits. And, so um, and now I want to compute how bad this possibility can be. Of course, one question that you could ask is well, what happens? Why can't we just do this computation uh, numerically? So I have, I know exactly what my initial state is. I know my unitary. I have a reasonable model for noise. So maybe I can just compute the output state numerically. Um, so can we just simulate this row of P directly? Uh, this, however, is something that is typically believed to be not possible, um, especially if you go to noises that are small. So we know that if the noise rate is high, then there are several results that have shown that this is possible. So in the discrete time circuit case, this was shown long back, and recently we showed this for continuous time uh, cases as well. But if your noise is sufficiently low, then we can give evidence that we can't really simulate this on a classical computer. So this direct simulation does not seem to be possible in general. So the question that then we could ask is that can we compute an upper bound on this energy without simulating this row of P directly, but maybe go some in a, in, a, in a different way to get this upper bound. So this slide is a little bit technical. Uh, sorry. So, so the idea here was to use this very, very simple trick from optimization theory called this Lagrange duality. I'm not sure many of you have heard of it, but I maybe give you um, the key ingredients. Uh, uh, and so the idea was to think about this uh, the operation of this quantum circuit is sort of op solving an optimization problem. You're maximizing the energy as we have been saying, and you're maximizing it with respect to the states that the circuit is developing at intermediate time. So after applying one layer of gates, you get a state row one. And after applying another layer of gates, you get a state row two. Then after applying third layer of gates, you get a state row three and so on. And so I'm, so I'm trying to optimize this energy with respect to all of these uh, states. But of course, these states are constrained. The moment you know the circuit and you know the initial state, you know what the final state is. So you can introduce these constraints on what the states of the uh, states at the intermediate layers of the circuit would be. And you could then also know, you also know that the entropy of these states is increasing as your time goes. So the entropy of the first state is going to be larger than some constant, and then the second entropy of the second state is going to be even larger because it has experienced more noise, and then the entropy of the third state is going to be even larger than the entropy of the second state. So you can think about this problem as a constrained optimization problem. And then what you could do is you could go into what is called the do. Um, so it's okay if this is not understandable, it's not very important. But what you really do is what for each of these constraints, you introduce what is called a dual variable. Now, the important point to note is that this dual variable is a many body operator. So, this constraint is a constraint between two matrices which are very, very large. Rho 1 is a 2 n by 2, 2 to the power n by 2 to the power n matrix. Rho 0 is also a 2 to the power n by 2 to the power n matrix. So, this constraint has 2 to the power n linear constraints in it. 
And so you essentially had two to the power n uh, by two into two to the power n equality constraints. And so for each of those equality constraints, you have to introduce a dual variable. So overall, if you just think of this as one constraint, you, you introduce a dual variable, which is the many body of it. And then for each of these entropy constraints, because this is just a scalar constraint, because the entropy is a scalar, you will introduce another dual variable, um, which is going, which you can think of as a temperature that is being developed at these limits. Now, what you can do with these dual variables very interestingly is construct what is called a dual function. So a dual function, I don't, I won't go into how it is constructed, it's based, it's a it's standard optimization theory jargon, but maybe we don't have time for that. Uh, is that this dual function is essentially a function that you can write in terms of these dual variables. And this has a certificate that this dual function is always going to be larger than the cost function that you're trying to offer now. This is a certificate that just comes from Lagrangian duality. So the dual function is always larger. So what this tells me is that I can evaluate this dual function um, at any value of the dual variable, and I will get an upper bound on my cost function. And then I can start thinking about when is it easy to evaluate this dual function, because remember these sigmas are exponentially large matrices. So maybe this dual function can only be evaluated for some specific classes of sigma, like sigma can be parameterized by what are known as tensor networks and so on, where some of the computations that arise in this dual function can be easy. So this was sort of the idea that we started exploring numerically, and we wanted to understand if I can evaluate this dual function at certain answers for sigma, then can I get useful upper bounds on this cost function? So here I show you um, uh, some numerical results for Gaussian match gate circuits, and there are also a bunch of theoretical results that we can prove on Gaussian match gate circuits for these models, but I won't go into that. But maybe these numerical results are interesting. And so what you see in these results, this is for 1D and this is for 2D, is that I, I display what is the output of the circuit. So Gaussian match gate circuits are these special quantum circuits which you can actually simulate on classical computers efficiently, so they're not like these quantum circuits that are difficult to simulate, and we use it for benchmarks where we exactly compute, uh, see it when compare it with what the method is doing. So you would take Gaussian match gate circuits, and if you look at Gaussian match gate circuits in the presence of noise, this is what the circuit output looks like. And I want to upper bound the circuit output. If I just use the bounds that exist in literature based on entropy constraints that I've been describing, you essentially get this bound here, which is an upper bound, but you can see it's not really representative, especially in low noise regime. And this is for one year, this is sort of a two year, which the proliferation of errors is even worse. And now, using this duality, so the idea and trick, what we can then do is compute another bound, which uh, is more complicated to compute than uh, the, the, uh, the uh, entropy constraint, but it takes in information about the circuit as well, and it really accounts for the circuit constraint. And you can see that the bound that we can compute uh, just empirically performs much better than the uh, dual bound. And in fact, for example, this is the 2D case, and in 2D case, you can see that the scaling of the uh, of the uh, previous bounds with the system size is much worse than, uh, sorry, the scaling of the actual circuit output is much worse. The approximation ratio drops much faster with n than if you look at the scalings of, you know, of the upper bound. So the upper bound is not really representative of the scaling. But if you do this like random duality method, you actually are able to get the scaling quite accurately um, for even large, uh, for, for large system sizes. And for Gaussian match gate circuits, you can actually show that there is a separation between the scalings of this duality bound and the, uh, and the bound that you would see on entropy. Okay, so this is all what I wanted to present on this pessimistic set of results. Uh, there's some questions. Uh, okay. okay, so now maybe I want to go into a slightly more optimistic set of um, questions. And the question now that we start asking is that, okay, I gave a set of impossibility results. So I told you that here is a noise rate beyond which things are not going to work. And now I want to go to noise rates which are small. Right, so I maybe I compute that after a noise rate of one percent or two percent for system size of hundred, um, my hardware is useless. I can, I can do that on classical computer. But then, can I do anything with noise rates less than one percent? That question is still not the answer. So the next thing that we started thinking about is that are there any problems where I have errors, uh, where in a finite rate of error, but without doing error correction, we can expect something useful. And so the part of the problem that we started thinking about, which is maybe because we come more from physics side as opposed to computer science, are many body physics problems as opposed to maybe thinking about the traditional quantum algorithms that maybe you could think uh, for, for the setup. I know that there are some papers which have studied this recently for like Simon's algorithms and so on as well. Um, and uh, so we started thinking about many body problems, right? So we wanted to think about a physics problem. The physics problem 
in general, you can think of, I mean, with any few of physicists, this is very common. You think of a lattice, every lattice has one qubit or one spin, and then these spins are interacting with each other. Maybe you have some nearest neighbor interactions from this lattice. And you can typically describe these interactions by a Hamiltonian, which is a sum of some interaction term. So you can imagine that in this Hamiltonian, I have a term for the interaction between these two spins, and I have another term for these two spins, and then these two spins as well. So you write it in some of very many terms. And then you could be interested in looking at problems of dynamics in which you evolve your initial state according to uh, a Hamiltonian and then compute some object, or you could be interested in equilibrium problems. So where you might be interested in looking at the ground state of this Hamiltonian or the big state of this Hamiltonian. So this is typically the format in which a lot of interesting important problems fall into. Um, and now we want to solve these problems using a quantum device or a quantum simulator, as we have been discussing. So what you do in an unencoded quantum simulator is that you don't do any error correction. You just take the Hamiltonian and put it on, put it on your quantum simulator. So you design your quantum simulator your experiment in such a way that the Hamiltonian of the experiment is equal to the Hamiltonian that you have to target to the best of your ability. Of course, so what happens is that when you do this, you don't get the exactly the right Hamiltonian. You have an error in your Hamiltonian that um, every term in your Hamiltonian can have a slight error delta. Um, and so the observable that you measure is, of course, not equal to the observable that you are interested in computing. And now the question is how different are these observables, right? So now what is the typical scenario that we uh, expect, and this is maybe a little bit qualitative, but it can be made rigorous as well, is that in the worst case, if you have this error in every term of your Hamiltonian, the error in your observable becomes very, very large. The reason why this error in your observable becomes very, very large um, is because if you look at the errors in your Hamiltonian, those are very large. And so if you remember, the Hamiltonian is the sum of many, many terms, and each term is incurring an error. So if you look at the total error in your Hamiltonian, then this total error actually scales with n. So as you make n larger and larger, the error in your Hamiltonian becomes larger and larger. And then you could, in general, what this implies is that if you take a random observable or there are some worst case observables there, if the error in your Hamiltonian is departing, is really diverging with n, then the error in your observable is also going to be diverging with n. So in general, you can't really expect to go to large system sizes and sort of prevent these errors from accumulating and making the answer from the field. In the physics community, however, there is sort of this expectation that this, while this is the worst case scenario, this doesn't really happen in actually a different problem. Uh, and so this is usually set as somewhat of a qualitative conjecture, which is that, well, if you take a typical problem in many body physics, then you have an error delta in each term of your Hamiltonian. So the distance between your Hamiltonian is very, very large. But when you actually measure, some reasonable order parameter in your many body model, like maybe you measure local observables, you measure like some, uh, you know, translationally invariant observables, and so on. So you're not looking at arbitrary observables, but you're looking at these very special observables that have some dynamic limit. Then the error in the, in the observable is, is independent of n. So the error between the observables does not actually diverge as you make it larger and larger. Um, and so, and it goes to zero as delta goes to zero. So in some sense, you can expect that for at least for these problems, if I have some error in my uh, hardware, then the error in my observable is not too large and I can hope to get uh, a good value or a good estimate of the observable without really uh, doing error correction. Right? So this was the result. So what we wanted to do in this project was to understand the setup more carefully and to see that if this if there are actually any situations where one can prove that this happens and maybe those situations will give evidence for the fact that we can um, solve those problems on noisy quantum simulators and still get an advantage to the classical algorithm. Okay, so what we started doing was look at if what are called the free fermion models. Uh, maybe I will not skip, I will skip this because this is just a primer on free fermion models. I'll just say what this is very quickly. So free fermion models are essentially a special class of many body models. So you're looking at fermions, fermions are like electrons, and you have one electron on every point on the lattice, right? So you have an n by n lattice with uh, n electrons, and you have several electrons for each point of the lattice. Um, and what you can then do is you can write down these special classes of Hamiltonians, which are quadratic in the ideation and creation operators of these electrons. If you don't understand what this means, doesn't matter. Right? Uh, but essentially, these are special classes of Hamiltonian. They're not generic, uh, but they are Hamiltonians which we can study to a great extent. And then, what we started then thinking about is take a free fermion model H and we sort of perturb this free fermion model to H prime. 
which has an error in each term of the Hamiltonian, as I mentioned. So if you look at again, as I mentioned, the non-error between H and H prime, it is going to diverge with N, it is going to the N by itself. And what we were interested in understanding is if the, if now we look at some observable um, uh, in dynamics, so we are looking at dynamics, and now if you look at some special classes of observable, does this error become smaller? So the classes of observable that we sort of chose to study here were the scale local Gaussian observable. So they are basically observables that are local, so they only act on a few electrons at a time. And these are the kind of observables that we are typically interested in computing in many body physics problems. You might be interested in computing something like a current or a magnetization, which is usually some kind of a local observable, right? And then here, what one could prove is that if you look at the error in between the observable O and the observable in the perturbed Hamiltonian O prime, H prime, for the dynamics. So here, the setting is that you're taking an initial state and you're evolving it in time t uh, with the Hamiltonian, and you can then bound the error that you get in between the dynamics of these two Hamiltonians, and you get O of t times delta. So you see that this bound that we can provide here is independent of n. So this really tells you that this observable is a sort of independent of the uh, uh, independent of the so, so the error in the observable is independent of the system size, and that's a uh, that's a positive thing for these problems because it seems to indicate that you can get these kind of observables on noisy quantum computers with some guarantee in your theory. And I want to maybe remark that this is actually easy to show in the more general case of spin models. So as I mentioned, three fermion models are simple models, but we can go to more general spin models. Um, and show a similar result. The bound is much looser than you get for three fermion models, um, but, but you get a similar result that if you have locally interactive spin models, then the error in your observable, any kind of local observable, is actually stable to errors in your Hamiltonian. So you possibly expect to be able to simulate local observables uh, on quantum simulators uh, without doing error detection. Okay. Um, but maybe this was a little bit obvious for uh, many people in the field. So what we also wanted to think about are ground states, which are typically more complicated problems. And so here, what we wanted to think about are, again, we take Gaussian Hamiltonians and we take perturbations of these Gaussian Hamiltonians. Again, the same picture, the error when the Hamiltonian is much, much larger. So you can say O of n itself. And we now take a much more restricted class of observables, which are translationally invariant local observables. So translationally invariant local observables are observables when I take one local observable and then I translate it on each side of my lattice and then I add up all of these locations. So if you're thinking about computing uh, some kind of a, let's say, uh, magnetization in your sample, then you want to go and take magnetization at every spin and add them up. So you get a translationally invariant local observable. So very large class of all the parameters that people study in many body physics are translationally invariant local observables. And here, what we could prove is that if you now look at the ground state of these two Hamiltonians, the ground state is going to be slightly different because H and H prime are different, but the ground, the, the, the translationally invariant local observable are robust, uh, robust in the sense that on increasing N, which is the system size, the error in the translationally invariant local observable does not diverge with N. So this seems to indicate that even for ground state problems, you have a stability in, uh, in quantum simulators. So maybe quantum simulators are good at solving these kinds of local observables in terms. And I want to maybe mention a few things about these kinds of results is that if you actually take the ground states themselves of H and H prime, and you look at the distance between the ground states, that distance diverges with N. That's maybe not that surprising. The distance between the ground state is diverging with n, but the whole point is that the observables that we are looking at are special. And even though the ground states are very, very different, the local observables are not very different. So your errors in your local observables again allow you to sort of show that noise is going to be not going to be a very big factor at um, uh, in, in these problems. Okay. Is alpha defined? Uh, yes, you can compute alpha as a constant. You can compute alpha. It, it roughly it, it roughly depends on how flat the band of the initial Hamiltonian. So you can think of the Hamiltonian in bands. Uh, if the band is very flat, alpha becomes smaller. If the band is very very if it's not flat, then alpha is large. So it depends on the curvature of the band. Yes. Um, of course, that's for if for that for that discussion, it has to be translationally invariant, but you can. Generalize this idea to non translationally invariant computers. Okay. So now this result is actually a generally surprising result. Um, generally surprising result for me. The reason why it's generally surprising, I'll explain in a minute. Um, 
And the reason why this is uh, surprising is uh, maybe because conventional wisdom in many body physics is that you don't expect stability in what are called gapless models. So I'll explain what gapless models are. So typically, when we think about many body models, you're sort of thinking about the energy spectrum of the models. So it has some ground state and it has an excited state one after the other, right? And you have some two to the power n states that are in the spectrum. And then for many models, you have what are called gaps in your uh, spectrum. And what gap means is that the ground state has an energy which is very different from the uh, from the first excited state. Yeah. Now, as you increase n, which is the number of uh, spins or the number of your problem size, what happens is that the number of states here keeps on increasing. So the density of states that you will see here will become very, very large. This will become an almost like a continuum of states because you know, when you're thinking the part and states are then being very, very large. But for gap models, what is guaranteed is that as you increase n, this gap remains as it is. The gap is close, it remains fixed at some O of n value. So these kind of models are called gap states. For these kind of gap models, you do expect stability of those collaborators. We actually proved that one person from Davis, proved on after college uh, several times. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the stability of these local observables um, can be understood in the following way. If you have a gap Hamiltonian, then you have what are called exponentially decaying correlation in the ground state. So if you take ground states and you look at how correlated two spins are, which are very far apart in distance, then they are they, they are almost uncorrelated with each other. And this can be really made rigorous. It was first made rigorous by Hastings um, in a very early job. So because you have these exponentially decaying correlations, you sort of expect stability because it means that when I have errors and I should only if I take a local observable, I should only be affected by errors in terms that are sort of within some radius of that local observable because it is uncorrelated with size that's very, very part of it. This is a very, very vague description of eye gap models of stable. It's actually quite a difficult task to prove the stability. But for gapless models, there is no such exponential degree of correlations. Gapless models can have ground state of every quality. However, even for these gapless models, if you look at translation we made in local observables so the three from young case, what we find is that they turn out to be safer. So that's a surprising result. Because in gapless model, there is no exponential degree of correlation. They're in general expected to be very unstable because they're extremely close in energy. This gap becomes zero and then it is very, very large. So even a slight error will mix this ground state with all these side states. But what we can show here is that there is stability for gapless models as well. And what is it even more interesting about this problem, so I understand this may be a little bit more detailed, but I wanted to mention this, is that this actually does not hold for local observables that are non-translational invariant. So the translational invariant is very important. So the averaging that comes by taking an observable and measuring it at each sign of the averaging is extremely important. And so there is actually a very nice counter example that you can make for non-translational invariant local observables. It's obviously some people have worked on this. Kind of problems, and that is that of what is called ambition localization in many body physics. And the problem is basically you take a Hamiltonian that has some hopping in between different terms with between different lines, and this hopping is a constant. So the and so this model is a model where your electron can go from one side to another side with a constant rate j. If you take these kind of models, then and you look at the ground state, then the ground state turns out to be plane waves of electrons. So the, the ground state is sort of delocalized on the entire chain. So if you measure a local observable, you get a very, very tiny value because the ground state is completely spread on the entire chain. If you introduce a disorder now on every side, so you keep this term, but you introduce like an error on every side, and this disorder can be uh, uh, can be very small. It, it does not matter how small it is. It can be 0.1%, 0.001, however small you want to like. Irrespective of how small this disorder is, it localizes the ground state. So the ground state of this Hamiltonian is completely localized and it has an exponential, it is almost exponentially clustered at one side. And so what that means is that if you take a local observable, that is not translation in radian, you just take a local observable at, at the side where you are localizing, then you would see a huge error in between these two models. Because in one case, you're measuring this observable in a plane way, which is a completely delocalized state. In the other case, you're measuring a local observable and you're exponentially localized state. So you're going to see a huge error in this no matter what is delta. So in the limit of time going to infinity, this error is necessarily going to be such. But the moment you think about translationally invariant models, this counterexample doesn't work because then you the contribution of 
this localization to the average is very, very small, so you need some stability for translation in data models. Uh, sorry, translationally invariant local observables. So, so that was somewhat of a surprising result that translationally invariant local observables seem to be very differently from generic local observables, and, or, and they seem to be more stable than generic local observables. Okay, so this is my final slide. I've been coming to the end of my talk. And so what I wanted to do here was maybe give a very, very simple, very hand wavy argument for why quantum simulators are not a bad idea. Um, and so the idea, so what I've been telling you up to now are that there are some, these class of problems that are stable. So if you think about many body problems in general, you have a lot of problems. And there are some problems which seem to be problems where some, a little bit of error in your Hamiltonian will not affect your answer very much. So these are the smaller class of stable problems. Okay. And of course, now what we want to ask here is that when you have stable problems, but are these are these stable problems which cannot be simulated on a classical computer? And do we have even any uh, reason to believe that any of these stable problems are problems for which quantum simulators should be worth using? Or maybe in order to get classical advantage, you want to solve a problem that is not stable. And in that case, you definitely need error correction. If it so happens, the stable problems end up being the subset of problems that can be simulated on classical computers. And maybe I won't go into this, this may be a little bit technical, but you sort of need to think about the runtime of your classical algorithm slightly differently. Uh, but maybe the key thing to look at are these three columns. So what we sort of show is that for dynamics, for free fermions, and very trivially for spin models as well, for gap ground state, it holds again for spin models as well. And for gapless ground state, you can get to those from free fermion results that you have stability sort of in all of these three problems. That's what we show. Um, now, uh, if you think about the advantage, then now uh, this is not being very rigorous in a computer science complexity theory sort of way, but as far as we look at the best known algorithms that are known to stimulate dynamics and ground states for, uh, for many body problems, and you look at the corresponding runtime that you would get on a quantum simulator, what you find is that, well, what you can conjecture rather, these are not provable results, these are all conjectures is that you have an advantage in dynamics, which is super polynomial, an advantage in ground states, which is super polynomial for gap models, and an advantage in ground states of gapless models, which could possibly be exponential. And in all of these problems, you have a stability of, uh, of your local obstacles. So, so this sort of is trying to convince you that you know, if you're building a quantum simulator and you expect to be able to solve some kind of problem uh, in the near term, uh, a main body physics problem in the near term, there is hope if your errors can be small enough without doing any error correction of all problems. Okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to end with. And these are some questions that we left off. I just want to leave it here and not hear it. Thank you very much for Great. this interesting talk about how we can uh, go around the uh, error correction and do anal uh, animal simulation. Now we have questions in the audience. Yeah, yeah. Is the previous slide the classical one time or is it uh, like log on it? Ah, it's just two to the power. Sorry, that's a typo. Okay. Two, two to the power, of course. Mm -hmm. No, 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 that's a typo. I, I saw this earlier as well. I didn't correct it. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's uh, oh, it's it's gone. Ah, okay, no problem. Yeah, it does just come. Like the, the the best. So for dynamics, there is a recent result which gives you poly and one by epsilon. So that just comes from the fact that you can truncate in light cone and you have some log one by epsilon correction. Um, so two to the power in two or higher dimension is super polynomial, I thank you. Uh, but I, I think there is a recent result that showed that this can be polynomial in epsilon. So it can be one by epsilon to the power something, but that power grows very fast with the time that you're simulating for. So that power increases exponentially with T. And that were based on these sort of cluster expansion like techniques to uh, compute observables, yeah. Okay. Right. So, so yeah, I have a, a, another question. So a, a little bit earlier in the talk, you had uh, uh, the scheme with U and U dagger. Yeah. And and, and so, so basically you're looking at how the error propagates. And if you go in time in one direction and the other direction, 
uh, how much error you accumulate. Yeah, I mean, so what we wanted to, so maybe one another way of thinking about that is, maybe you can think about it just like as a quantum memory of sorts that I'm not really doing any operation on through my circuit. I'm just keeping a quantum state and I'm trying to keep it the same. Mm -hmm. um, but I maybe I, I put a circuit there, mm -hmm. just which is not doing anything, mm -hmm. but in the presence of errors that will proliferate. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we went with this model is because if you look at variational quantum algorithms or any quantum algorithm, which is, let's say, producing an output that's a product state, the way it usually goes is that it first builds a very entangled state in the middle, mm -hmm. and then it sort of disentangles that state into a product state that you then measure, right, which has your answer for your classical problem. So our uh, the, the motivation behind defining this class of problems was that, well, you are first building entanglement with a unitary circuit and then unentangling it with another unitary circuit. So you have the same, well, very vaguely the entanglement pattern. Mm -hmm. And then you can see if I introduce errors, then what does this do to the output of your circuit? Yeah. Yeah, that's right.